Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you had a good break, um, a short one. We continue our amazing faculty and educators and we're so happy that we have Dr. Dobri Kaprov with us uh, for the afternoon session. Uh, I think that you'll find this to be very exciting, you know, new option and treatment for a variety of things, especially in the, in the world of anti-aging, regenerative medicine, uh, into the world of omics and longevity and lifespan. So we were so happy that he was able to join us today. He has worked in the field of therapeutic apheresis for more than 30 years now and has extensively published um, in this area and on the subject matter. Um, his, his really, his expertise also doves into extensive experience with the immune system disorders that lead uh, to the development of therapeutic programs that foster immune system health and longevity through this unique uh, approach. Now we know more and more, it really the field of inflammaging immunosenescence is at least one of the keys to the fountain of youth and longevity. So we definitely uh, appreciate all this research that you guys are doing to kind of keep us uh, healthier and happier. He's the recipient of multiple awards and recognition uh, for his contribution in the field of apheresis and immunology. And he's the first physician to be board certified um, in the field of hemipheresis. So Dr. Kiprov is also currently involved in several clinical trials. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kiprov. We look um, so forward to your presentation. Thank you. So in this presentation, uh, I will discuss the very complex biology of aging. And uh, then uh, we will address a very interesting subject uh, of how uh, an experimental animal model led to, to all kinds of developments in the field of anti-aging and also sparked the development of an approach that uh, has the potential to be very effective in the prevention and treatment of uh, a variety of age-related diseases. Over the last century, the lifespan of humans have expanded steadily over the years. And the main reason for that is the improvement in healthcare due to all kinds of developments in, in, in the field of medicine. Uh, unfortunately, we know that uh, we can keep people alive with the tools that we have in medicine today, but this does not necessarily mean that we keep them healthy and uh, uh, healthy enough to enjoy, to enjoy life in their uh, later years. So it is known that although we live longer, we do not live healthier. There are a variety of age-related chronic diseases that lead to mortality in adults over the age of 50, and especially over the age of 74. As you can see here, there are a variety of uh, mainly chronic inflammatory diseases that lead to morbidity and eventually mortality over the age of 50, and this exponentially climbs as we get, as we get older. So it is, it is prudent to notice that People do not die of old age. People die of diseases. And as you can see here with the prevalence of these diseases, it is not uh, difficult to imagine that people will die much more frequently of these diseases rather than of aging itself. Uh, <clears throat> now the chronic uh, prevalence of diseases obviously affects older people considerably more. And this leads to significant uh, financial difficulties for any healthcare system. And as the population grows older, more diseases uh, are recorded and they require more financing. And uh, this of course has led to attempts to create something against aging or the so-called anti-aging medicine. And uh, a lot of existing big pharma as well as new companies are investing enormous amounts of money to try to conquer this problem. Now, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical approach to anti-aging has not been successful over the last 20 years. Uh, big pharma as well as the newer pharmacological companies are looking for a silver bullet, developing miracle drugs like senolytics 
And uh, as we all know, this has not yielded any success over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, it is highly unlikely that a single drug can affect a complex biologic process such as aging. And I think that people are starting to realize that. And there are scientists that are leaning into the direction of evolving multidimensional approach to aging. Now, I'm going to discuss with you, obviously in the short terms, but uh, the biology of, of aging and just to emphasize how important and how complex it is. In young people, the systemic milieu is uh, well regulated and creates a homeostasis. From time to time, we can uh, uh, move away from the homeostasis if we exercise very intensely or we get sick for a shorter period of time, we get out of the homeostatic, the, con the, the control room, and uh, we move into somewhat uh, stressful situation. But during the process of allostasis, we go back to normal homeostasis. However, as we age, the allostasis process starts to diminish and uh, uh, people become more prone to develop a disease. So it is advisable that we address this issue and attack this process right here where the beginning of the lack of allostasis or diminished allostasis takes place. If we do not, then there is a progression of the, of the problem which leads eventually to death. However, if we are successful in diminishing this process, we can uh, prolong health and prolong life at the same time. Now, as you heard a lot uh, about uh, proteomics today and yesterday, uh, it is uh, prudent to remind you that uh, the plasma proteins are very important and they uh, either have, either live in an equilibrium or just uh, uh, create havoc and disease. And it turns out that they do change over the period of lifespan. So as we get older, this balance of different proteins in our plasma and in the general systemic milieu changes dramatically actually. So to address the pathophysiology of aging, um, I will talk to you about three processes that are very important. They're different in a way, but uh, they're somehow integrated and affect the aging process uh, significantly. Well, first, we'll talk about inflammation, chronic inflammation, hence the term inflammaging. Acute inflammation is uh, the response of the immune system to anything that the immune system considers dangerous. Uh, good examples are viral infections, bacterial infections, and cancer. The acute immune response is normal response, and it is very well controlled by the regulatory system of the, the, the immune system, and it goes back to dormant or normal state after the danger has been removed. On the other hand, chronic inflammation is induced either by persistent low-grade infection over the years or by other external factors. Uh, it is characterized by uh, lack or incompetence of re regulatory cells that are supposed to stop the process and uh, chronic inflammation can last and usually last many, many years and is responsible for causing a variety of diseases as we already uh, looked at the list of that. Uh, this is an article that I highly recommend, and it uh, looks at the chronic inflammation and the etiology of, of uh, different diseases that are associated with aging and how this whole system of inflammation and uh, different diseases uh, affect the whole body and eventually lead to demise. So 
Aging is associated with chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation is associated with all these diseases listed here. This is a very interesting study that uh, points out how infections can affect other parts of the, uh, the system. So here with the, the green, the green uh, bars indicate, indicate what is expected in terms of uh, developing of heart attack in patients at a certain age, and these are elderly people. And the brown columns indicate the incidence of myocardial infarct and stroke after a viral infection, namely the flu. And as you can see here, the incidence of, of MI as well as stroke are dramatically increased after a viral infection. And one of the most common things that happens to older people, they get the flu more common despite vaccines sometimes. And uh, as we have seen over the last two years, they get some weird infections uh, that affect older people predominantly. So I think that this is very important in terms of how we deal with the problem of inflammation aging. The other process that contributes to, to this whole uh, increase in, in morbidity in older people is immunosenescence, which basically means aging of the, of the immune system. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a very long longitudinal study that followed uh, uh, many patients over the years and checked their phenotype of immunocompetent cells. And the lighter blue here on top indicates phenotype that is associated with aging. And at the bottom, the light blue indicates phenotype that is associated with, uh, with younger people. And uh, this clearly indicates that, that uh, with age, the immunocompetent cells change their phenotype as well as their function. As you can see here, there, is, there are changes that involve T lymphocytes, certainly negatively, and B lymphocytes also negatively. The third process that uh, has gotten a lot of attention as well is uh, cellular senescence. And one of the reasons it's getting attention is because uh, there is, of all these other processes, this, this appears to be the best target for a, for, a, for a single drug. So cellular senescence is characterized by an arrest of proliferation and a development of a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP. Now, SASP is, is basically uh, an accumulation of inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and other pro-inflammatory mo molecules. Now, it is important, is, especially if we view this as a potential, potential for a treatment to eliminate senescent cells, to remember that uh, senescent cells are pleiotropic. So whatever we develop in order to kill them, remove them, or injure them in other ways, uh, may have undesired consequences. So this is a key needs to be kept in mind. So here's a, again, the all the hallmarks of aging, the impaired immune system, immunosenescence, chronic inflammation, and cellular senescence, which leads to the development of all, all these diseases that we mentioned before. So I'm gonna move to the interesting experiment that really uh, lit, lit up the, the anti-aging science and, and uh, our approach to how we think about aging. Uh, this was a seminal article published by Irina and Michael Combo in 2005, where they described a well, relatively well-known uh, experimental model for studying aging. This model is called parabiosis. And uh, what they did is they sutured the skins of two genetically identical mice. And in this way, they created a common circulation between the two mice. And what they observed was that the old mouse became younger and the young mouse became older. <clears throat> They also published 
that there are morphologic changes that they observed in a variety of organs in, uh, in both mice, especially the young mouse. And they also observed functional changes in a variety of organs as well. And this, of course, was very exciting and led to the belief that somehow the young mouse con circulation contains substances that rejuvenate. And since this is a mythologically old uh, concept, everybody became to love it. And uh, they decided that the young blood is going to revitalize older people. And let's get the young people to donate blood and plasma. We take it, and uh, we're going to be young forever. And of course, uh, there were some uh, jokes made by them trying to demonstrate parabiosis in humans, which obviously is an impossibility. Uh, so one thing that people have forgotten is that humans are not mice. So translating a, an experimental animal model into humans is not that easy. And in fact, it is not common that it's being successfully done. Uh, I had been interested in, uh, in anti-aging for a long time. I was one of the first people to, to attend the A4M conference many years ago. And when I read the, the Comboys article, I thought that this could be translated into, into human experiments. And I published my hypothesis uh, about that. Uh, the Comboys got a sweep of my article and we got together. And since then we've been working together for the last, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years. Uh, so the idea is to use plasma exchange as a model of human parabiosis. And I will talk about plasma exchange more in a second. But instead of using another mouse uh, or another human, we use a machine to create this exchange of blood between the older patient or an older individual and whatever we want to infuse back into the patient. And the question is, what are we infusing and is it going to be helpful? So I'm going to try to play a video for you here and I hope that you can see it and hear it. Zoom has been Apheresis refers to a specialized medical procedure in which blood separation technology is used to remove abnormal plasma constituents or blood cells. Whole blood is removed from the patient into a blood cell separator, which utilizes centrifugal forces to separate whole blood into its individual components. Plasma, platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. Plasma, or a specific blood cell type can be removed and replaced with physiologic fluids or cells to treat relatively uncommon but usually life-threatening diseases. I hope that you were able to see and hear this. If, if not, uh, this video is available on my multiple websites. Uh, the website with my name and also there is a aphoresispro.com website and the vi multiple videos are available there for, for you to, to view. So this procedure is FDA approved for the treatment of many autoimmune diseases. Actually, we treat uh, approximately 100 different diseases with this procedure. Uh, it became popular in the early 80s and uh, now it's available to, to in many institutions, mainly in academic centers, at least for now. Uh, the introduction of plasma phoresis has made a huge impact in some very uh, serious medical conditions, actually deadly med medical conditions, such as thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TTP. The mortality rate of this disease before the introduction of plasma phoresis as a treatment modality was over 90%. Today, the mortality rate is as low, if not lower than 12%. So this is very dramatic. This is better than penicillin. Uh, the other aspect of therapeutic plasma exchange is, is that it works very well. If you have a patient with autoimmune disease, the first thing that people do is give them prednisone. 
Uh, and prednisone does work, but it takes time and it causes all kinds of side effects. Here, this is a patient with uh, myasthenia gravis, a neurologic autoimmune disorder. And it, it, this patient on the left side here has a typical ptosis of the eyelid. And uh, what you see on the right-hand side is after the plasmapheresis. Actually, this happened during the procedure itself. So it has an immediate, an immediate effect. This is why it's very attractive, especially in difficult situations where your patient is in ICU, can breathe or has bleeding problems or other severe uh, complications of a, of, a, of a disease. Then you want to act fast and you want to be successful most of the time. So of interest is we made a comparison between autoimmune diseases and older people. And both autoimmune diseases and older people have circulating autoantibodies against a variety of different antigens, more uh, common ANA as well as antiphospholipid antibodies. As you have probably read lately, antiphospholipid antibodies can be associated with some horrible coagulopathies uh, with or without COVID and some other neuro neurologic diseases. Autoimmune diseases, as well as older people, uh, have numerous pro-inflammatory factors circulating in their blood. And I have listed some of them here. So it only makes sense that you approach the elder people who need uh, treatment or preventive approach with a similar approach as we do with autoimmune diseases. So plasmapheresis can remove antibodies autoantibodies and fibrinogen very successfully. Another interesting fact is that the phenotype of immunocompetent cells in autoimmune diseases as well as in older people appears to be very similar. We have demonstrated and others have uh, published as well the fact that plasmapheresis can affect the phenotype of immunocompetent cells uh, in a variety of different autoimmune diseases. So based on, on these uh, observations, we decided that plasma exchange may be beneficial in a way that, that parabiosis was, was uh, successful in, in mice. And uh, the, initial the initial impression of, of the parabiosis in mice was that, yes, there may be something in, in young blood, in young plasma mainly, that uh, causes this rejuvenation to take place. Uh, in my original publication, I was uh, uh, very much against this idea because the infusion of plasma during plasma exchange leads to dramatic increase in side effects. And some of these side effects may be relatively mild, but some can be very severe. And in fact, they may be deadly in some, in some situations. So uh, both the convoys and I just didn't quite believe this idea that uh, uh, infusion of, of young blood is the cause of, uh, of the rejuvenation that we have observed. And the, the convoys based on, on uh, the instrumentation that I use in therapeutic plasma exchange created a, created a device that does kind of plasma exchange in, in mice as well. And they also were able to infuse blood without parabiosis, just infusion of blood from an older mouse to a young mouse. And what happened, this is their device, what happened was that the young mouse became older. And that's, we expected that from the parabiosis experiments. But then when young blood was infused into the older mouse, nothing happened. The old mouse remained old. So the convoys postulated that it is not the infusion of some magical substance, but it's the dilution of the bad stuff that causes aging. And from there, 
we decided to use 5% human albumin instead of uh, fresh frozen plasma because albumin is a very powerful antioxidant. It is anti-inflammatory. It is also immunomodulatory. And for all practical purposes, is the most significant protein in plasma. So last year, we published our initial uh, observations, both in mice and in humans, by basically doing plasma exchange in mice and in humans. <clears throat> And both in mice and in humans, we observed uh, fairly dramatic, dramatic changes. And I'm not gonna go through this whole thing. You can <clears throat> find the article, but I'd like to draw your attention in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the lower panel. And you can see these two black squares. The one to the very left is pre-TPE. So what was done here is a Petri dish with stem cells uh, was used and serum from a patient, a human patient <clears throat> was added to the Petri dish. As you can see here, there was no proliferation of cells at all. In fact, they all died. And if one added albumin to the same preparation, uh, external albumin, again, there was no proliferation. However, immediately after therapeutic plasma exchange, there, as you can see here, there is robust proliferation with or without the albumin. <clears throat> this is uh, another paper that uh, the Comboys published a little later on that showed how neurogenesis is affected by plasma exchange. <clears throat> and again, I'll bring you back to, to the paper that describes the changes in the proteome across uh, the lifespan. And that is very important because different proteins change the balance and this impairs the homeostasis. And uh, I think with the plasma exchange, we are able to reconstitute the homeostasis and uh, the healthy milieu where cells are allowed to function properly and uh, stem cells are allowed to proliferate. Uh, these are the proteomics that we have done to the left here is the mice and this is in the in the humans and in order to save time not going to go in detail through this however there is a resetting of the entire system to help and some of these studies were done a month after a single plasma exchange and uh, we found that there is accumulation actually of uh, health promoting proteins in addition to the removal of the pro-inflammatory proteins. And uh, this is a simplified version. This is a paper that's in press now. It's gonna be published probably within the next month or so to show the uh, cell culture experiments that, that I just described. The fact that we remove pro-inflammatory proteins and actually increase anti-inflammatory proteins. This was a surprise to all of us, but it does happen. And uh, here is uh, how we remove certain uh, very common in older people proteins that are pro-inflammatory, such as uh, C-reactive protein, C CRP. <clears throat> so in our experiments with albumin, and this is true for both uh, mice and, and humans, we are able to remove pro-inflammatory factors and keep them low for extended periods of time. We are able to improve the balance of immunocompetent cells. Uh, we provide very potent antioxidant effect by infusion of albumin. And clinically, we have shown decrease in arthritic pain, uh, improve of impaired liver function, improve of impaired renal function. And the fact that we have been able in the people we have treated so far to prevent infections. None of our subjects so far has developed any viral infection over the last four years. And remember in 2018, we had the worst uh, flu epidemic in the last 20 years. Uh, and these are medical professionals and uh, people who travel a great deal and they traveled extensively and worked in medical institutions through the entire COVID pandemic. And none of these people got sick without any uh, 
vaccines. At the beginning, obviously, there were no vaccines at all. So our observations so far are very encouraging. And this is how we treat the pathophysiology of aging, which, as we saw, is very complex. We have, we have inflammation aging, but plasma exchange removes the pro-inflammatory factors. We have cellular senescence, but we can remove saps with plasmapheresis, and we have shown that we can do that. And there is immunosenescence, and we successfully affect the phenotype of immunocompetent cells. So we throw all this garbage out in and remove the old milieu with the healthier and younger systemic milieu. Uh, and back to this slide, which tells us about the chronic diseases. Now, <clears throat> people say, yeah, you showed all that. It's uh, at that point, it's anecdotal. Uh, have you treated any age-related disease? And uh, we did, and we aimed at the one that is most commonly associated with old age. It may not be the most common age-related disease, but it's certainly the one that is associated with older age, and that is Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> so Alzheimer's disease is fairly common, and apparently it's growing rapidly for whatever reason. And it is estimated that one in 10 people have Alzheimer's disease. It is estimated that by 2050, 14 million people around the world will have Alzheimer's disease. The current hypothesis for the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease is the following. Chronic inflammation over time results in the production of beta amyloid, which circulates in the blood. It passes the blood brain barrier and it deposits in the brain uh, where it causes plaques with a very characteristic morphology. Because of this hypothesis, all kinds of attempts have been made to block the amyloid. And uh, there, in the, the last 15 years, there have been 800 patients treated in a variety of phase two, phase three clinical trials. And this costs more than $200 million. And the results have been very, very negative. Actually, uh, many of these drugs that have been tried cause all kinds of uh, side effects on top of the Alzheimer's symptomatology as well. So uh, the disappointment of these trials is so serious that uh, people have raised the question, is the hypothesis about amyloid plaques really the reason for the disease? So we still don't have an answer to that. However, there have been other attempts to remove beta amyloid from uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease. And this is a study that we did over the last uh, six years. I was involved in the organization of this trial from the very beginning. Uh, and the trial was completed two years ago. And it was randomized controlled clinical trial of plasma exchange with albumin replacement. And the control group underwent chamferesis, which uh, is a very difficult thing to do, and it's also a very expensive thing to do. So as I'm going to continue, I'd like to give uh, credit to the company that sponsored this study. It's a Spanish company called Griffles. And uh, it, it is interesting that they really uh, had no chance of really monetizing on this trial. And yet they did it to help people with Alzheimer's disease. So this trial involved 496 patients. They were treated in 41 hospitals, as well as outpatient facilities. The majority of them were treated in the United States, and uh, some of them were treated in Spain. The actual involvement of a patient involved 14 months. So we treated them and we followed them for 14 months. And this is the abstract of, of this study. And uh, without taking you into details, we were able to show that 
in moderately severe disease, we treated two groups of patients, moderately severe dementia and mild dementia. So in the moderately severe disease, we were able to arrest the progression of the disease in 67% of the patients and in none of the patients undergoing placebo. Interestingly enough, we were able to arrest the progression of the disease completely in patients with milder forms of Alzheimer's disease. And we have a new publication that's gonna come out later this year where we have looked at some secondary endpoints and these are more clinical. And in the clinical endpoints, uh, we clearly demonstrated that some of the patients, especially in the milder group, experienced uh, fairly dramatic neuropsychologic changes for the better. <clears throat> so people got excited about the Alzheimer study and our publications. And one of the common questions that we get, and, and uh, obviously justifiable, is, uh, well, how safe is this procedure? Or do we see adverse reactions of therapeutic plasma exchange? So the overall response uh, in the so-called experts in the field is, oh, this is you know very safe procedure. Well, I pulled some of the publications about adverse reactions of therapeutic uh, apheresis, and these are all from significant medical centers around the world. As you can see here, the percentage of adverse reactions varies fairly dramatically from one place to another. The green bars indicate all adverse reactions and the brown bars indicate the percentage of reactions when you do uh, exchange with fresh frozen plasma. And it's, you can see now why I was against the use of fresh frozen plasma, the dramatic increase. But interestingly enough, even in the hands of good people with experience, sometimes the adverse reactions are pretty high. Uh, and in others, in the institution of my good friend, uh, uh, Andrew Kaplan, the reactions are very low. Uh, in our experience, overall, we have 4% of adverse reactions. The AMBER study had 4% of adverse reactions. Interestingly enough, uh, in the United States procedures, we had only one adverse reaction. Uh, from 4,000 procedures and the rest were outside the United States. And in our clinical trial right now, uh, over the last four years, uh, knock on wood, we have not seen any adverse reaction. So there is dramatic difference between one place to another. So uh, this procedure can be very safe, but it needs to be administered by very experienced uh, people with, with good records as well. So I know that I'm a little early here, but this will allow for longer question and answer period. And I think that we have demonstrated here over the last several years that uh, therapeutic plasma exchange upregulates the immune system by removing pro-inflammatory proteins, increasing anti-inflammatory proteins, and changing immune cells phenotype. These and other properties of TPE make it a powerful tool for the prevention and treatment of age-related diseases. So the question is, are we done? And I think that we are far from done. We're in the process of organizing a controlled clinical trial for the prevention and treatment of other age-related diseases other than, other than Alzheimer's disease. And this is being planned now and we'll be, uh, we'll be starting this trial right away. We continue our observational studies, uh, both in, in uh, mice as well as in, as in humans. And uh, we do believe that there will be opportunities to enhance the role of therapeutic plasma exchange with uh, changing the fluids that we use, the, the, the exchange fluids, uh, possibly medications that will enhance or prolong the effect of plasma exchange. So we're far from done. There, there's much more work to be done and we're working previously to 
to conduct this work and, and bring people more hope. For the moment though, it, it is, it is uh, uh, rewarding for what we have seen so far. And it gives us hope that uh, better things are yet to come. Uh, <clears throat> so there is this controversy about health span versus lifespan. And I think that at this point, I certainly mentioned that earlier, people don't die of old age, people die of diseases. As you can see here on top, uh, if, if uh, morbidity is allowed to progress, uh, people die at a younger age. If uh, morbidity is slowed down with medications or plasmapheresis or whatever, uh, then lifespan is, is prolonged. And we can certainly <clears throat> look at uh, lifespan of over 100 years within, within the next uh, decade or so. It is very important to realize that it is better to have a health span that allows you to enjoy life rather than be morbid and still alive. So as a conclusion, I will float this idea that it is the idea to die as young as possible, as late as possible. And this is modified by me from Ashley Montague. And at this point, I will just open the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kiprav. So we do have a few questions and I think uh, there's interest for all of us. Where in the US can we get this plasma exchange? How long does it take? What is the cost? And also, is there an age limitation, if you will? Can we just go start getting this to stay as young as possible and, and live and die as healthy as possible? At the moment, we have a nationally approved IRB protocol that is uh, ongoing. We have one facility in San Francisco at the moment that that's available. And for the moment, people travel actually from around the world, including Australia to come and get, get the treatment. They're involved in the protocol. And uh, uh, we are in the process of opening additional clinics and hopefully, hopefully we'll have several uh, before the end of the year. The way we open clinics is to educate the physicians and the personnel there. We perform the procedures in every clinic. We, we do not rely on, on other people to do the procedures, but we train, we train the, the personnel, certainly the physicians, so that they can supervise the procedures, although we are constantly available to them. Uh, I don't believe that people who decide to buy a machine and become immediate experts is a good idea. As I showed you, side effects can arise and they do arise. And this is the last thing we want because many of these people that come to us, they're relatively healthy individuals. The last thing you want to do is harm them. So that's, that's very important. Uh, we have two different schedules depending on the, the phenotype of the patients as measured by proteomics and, and, and other uh, laboratory tests. Um, so that's the way it is. We, we have a small grant, so certain people are not charged at all. Uh, others are charged, and I am not in, at liberty to reveal the actual dollar amount, but uh, you know we, we do provide free consultations and after evaluation, we, we mentioned price. Uh, we have people who really need the, disease, the treatment, not only for anti-aging, but for other, for other reasons. And we keep our grants to be able to help people who cannot help themselves. And uh, in terms of age, we treat a variety of autoimmune diseases, as I mentioned, and regardless of age, they, they, they can be children uh, with certain diseases, they can be young adults or they can be elderly individuals. In the uh, study that relates to anti-aging, the cutoff is 50. We do not accept patients in this, uh, in this protocol uh, below 50. 
Great. So for Alzheimer, for the Alzheimer's study, would the patients need more plasmapheresis after the improvement? So for maintenance per se, so you can keep them healthier? This is a great question. I, uh, uh, the, the information we have is solely from the, from the study that we conducted. So the, the study that we conducted, patients underwent six procedures over a short period of time, two or three weeks, depending on their vascular access. And then they were treated for six months, every month. So there was the initial aggressive treatment and then there was chronic treatment over, over six months. And these patients were followed for additional six months after the last plasmapheresis procedure. So this is all the information we have. Uh, I, if I have to speculate, I think that uh, many of these patients will most likely require additional chronic treatments, maybe not as frequent as once a month, but maybe once every quarter or three times a year. Uh, we are looking into this. I don't have the answer to that. There is an interesting subgroup of patients with Alzheimer's disease who have genetic predisposition to the disease. And uh, their relatives, such as their parents, have experienced the development of Alzheimer's disease in very early age for Alzheimer's, in age 40, 50. And some of these younger people do die. So their, their offspring, their kids, are very much concerned. It's this, this disease leads to the constant production of beta amyloid by the liver. And again, it's a genetic predisposition. Now, this particular group of patients, fortunately, they're not very, they're not that many, uh, will require more frequent treatment. I, uh, we treat them once or twice uh, every, every two months. So in order to do this, do you have to be board certified in apheresis or how do you get trained? And is this clinically available yet or when do you anticipate it to be? Uh, we offer fellowship for, for physicians and we help them develop, develop their own clinic. They can uh, affiliate with us. So this, this makes things easier because we provide basically a turnkey operation. Uh, but we, we will qualify them to, to, supervise, to supervise the procedures. And uh, uh, then you know, they can enroll their, their own patients. So that's, that's available, it's available now. Uh, we are opening, as I mentioned, uh, we have one other clinic in Miami, which is functional and it's affiliate uh, with a trained physician and nurses. And uh, we're opening a few more. So it is available at the moment though, uh, it is San Francisco and Miami and hopefully by the end of the year, we can offer more. This currently, I know, is under grant and IRB approval. Um, is this covered by insurance if, under certain settings with approved or trained physicians like yourself? Not to my knowledge. I think that uh, for Alzheimer's disease, we hope to have an approval after the publication of our second paper and the publication of the ASWA indications, which will come in 2023. Uh, <clears throat> As you can probably guess, the majority of the patients with Alzheimer's disease are Medicare beneficiaries. And uh, Medicare is not an easy organization to work with. Uh, so we are already working with, with Medicare to try to approve the, this treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I expect this to be a slow process. So I would say two years from today. Uh, for the anti-aging, I think that before we do our controlled clinical trial, which is in, in the planning now, it will be very difficult to obtain, to obtain uh, insurance. For autoimmune diseases uh, that there is enough publication and clinical studies to show that therapeutic plasma exchange is effective, there is, there is uh, uh, insurance coverage, mainly from from uh, uh, private, private insurance. And uh, in order to get the insurance coverage, you have to be 
an approved provider for a certain plan like Anthem, Blue Shield and so forth. You have to be an approved provider. Sounds great. And then the last question is, how can they uh, get in touch with you? Is that the dobrikiprov.com um, website for training or further additional info? I put that in the chat yes. for everybody, but... Yes, there is a contact form, there is a telephone number, and, and there is an email address for me. Okay, perfect. Well, Dr. Kiprov, this was so enlightening and so amazing to see some of the research, especially in neurology, because a lot of times it's diagnosed and adios, and we don't have, honestly, a lot of tools. So this is a great additional tool for uh, treatment in, in lifespan aging, revolutionarily personalized medicine. So we so appreciate you being with us today. And thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for having me. Take care.